كانت رائعة شاطر محترم أنا أول مرة نتقابل فبكرة الساعة تسعة ونص تسعة ونص في المكتبة ال ال تمشي مع بكرة صباحا تكون معهم تمشي منهم إن شاء الله هاي ما ما تجد تستناك هاي موجودة بونجور أتوس بونجور Bonjour, une minute, une minute seulement. Donc, euh, comme vous le savez, euh, je suis Abel Zouage, directeur des études de, de l'IFAO. Et nous avons le très grand honneur, dans le cadre de cette Winter School, euh, d'accueillir le professeur Nelly Hanna. Et euh, comme vous le savez, euh, le professeur Nelly Hanna va donc introduire euh, le sujet donc de la Winter School. Elle est un scolaire très connu et célèbre qui a préparé sa thèse d'État. Là aussi, je crois que vous le savez, donc en France, sous la direction, je crois, d'André Raymond, que j'ai eu le grand plaisir de rencontrer. I will, I, I will speak in, uh, in, in, in English after, okay, yeah. but I think it's important as well to, to start with the French, uh, in the French Institute. <laughs> so, uh, donc, uh, et qui a préparé sa thèse uh, uh, donc, sous la direction du très grand professeur qui était uh, André Raymond, qui a dirigé en particulier uh, l'Institut français de Damas, où moi, uh, je l'avais connu, il y a bien longtemps, et qui euh, a enseigné euh, à l'université américaine du Caire, euh, qui enseignait depuis 1991. Elle a aussi été professeure et euh, professeure invitée à l'école des hautes études en sciences sociales à Harvard et à l'Ouasida University à Tokyo. So, thank you very much, uh, uh, professor, for coming today to uh, open, in order to open this uh, winter school, which is dedicated to Egypt and the Ottoman Empire, Empire uh, historiographic approach. It's the, the title of your lecture. As uh, I said in French, so uh, you uh, earned your doct doctorat d'état at the University of Aix-en-Provence in France. Uh, supervised by, uh, by, uh, by uh, Professor uh, André Raymond, and she has been teaching full-time at IUC since uh, 1991. And she contributed at, as a professor and guest lecturer at the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales at uh, Harvard University and at uh, Wasida uh, University in Tokyo. Thank you, and I give you the mic. Thank you for coming as well. Now. Okay, thank you very much, first of all, for your generous introduction, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, institution, which we have uh, been coming to ever since we were students, and which has contributed so much to our education and our cultural enrich enrichment. When I was a student, we used to come and we met all the giants of the time, like uh, Jean-Claude Garcin and uh, André Raymond. And, and the, it has since been a very important part of cultural life in Cairo. So thank you again for this kind invitation. I'm very honored to be here and to speak into this uh, school, uh, winter school. All of us who work on Ottoman Egypt 
are uh, deeply indebted to the work of André Raymond and specifically to his book, Artisan et Commerçant au Caire, uh, because of maybe two points which were very important for the generation that came after. He was the first one who introduced us uh, to the use of uh, court records in the study of Ottoman Egypt. And he was one of the first few people who uh, rejected the idea that Ottoman Egypt was in decline, which had been part of the mainstream history of the time, and who offered an alternative to this. Uh, as a result, a lot of people became interested, I'm talking mainly about historians in Egypt, uh, became interested in writing about Ottoman Egypt. It was a subject that was not written much about before. And we formed a new generation of Ottomanists in this circle. Uh, in the meantime, they have produced articles and books on many subjects, on institutions of Ottoman Egypt like the judiciary, the guilds, on economic history, on the family, on social history. And many young people became interested in this subject. I refer to Magdi Gerges here, but many others who are not with us here, Nasser Ibrahim, for example. Mohammed Afifi wrote some very important work also on Ottoman Egypt. Hossam Abdel Mahdi, so really there is uh, quite a number of uh, people who became interested, I think, as a result of the French Institute and the French tradition in, uh, in writing about Ottoman Egypt uh, was at the source of these. In, uh, in short, what we had by the, you know, 10, 20 years subsequent uh, to, th to this movement, uh, uh, a good knowledge about Ottoman Egypt, which we had not had before. The subject I want to talk about today, I'm not very confident standing, so. The subject I want to talk about today is uh, uh, rather an understudied subject about Ottoman Egypt. It is the place of Egypt in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, this is a subject uh, of a book I just finished and therefore it is still fresh in my mind and I still have a few obsessions about it. And so this is how I decided uh, to, to, to give this talk. Uh, it is a subject, I think, which is very important, given the fact we know a lot about Ottoman Egypt now as a result of the many studies that came up, and given the fact that even in Ottoman studies there has been such a surge of scholarship, enormous scholarship, on the Ottoman world, on the Ottoman Empire as a whole, in its parts, in its whole, in its military, so many, many, many subjects have been written which are easy to find on any internet link, many internet links. So what is the problem and uh, why am I trying to solve uh, this problem? Uh, I th uh, the conquest of 1517 uh, was a very important event for Egypt. It ended the Mamluk Empire which had dominated the Islamic world for three centuries it turned Egypt from the center of this empire, the center of the Islamic world, into a province. So it was a, it's a big change. Uh, many of the Mamluks were massacred. So anyway, as far as Ibn Ayyaz tells us, uh, they were really brought down to their feet uh, within a few years after the conquest. This is as far as Egypt is concerned. Uh, for the Ottoman Empire, the conquest of Egypt also was a very important event. In fact, it was a transformative event. It transformed the Ottoman Empire in more than one way. Uh, uh, especially that it was followed by, after the conquest of Egypt, Syria, it was followed by the conquest of almost the whole of the Arab-speaking world, uh, Yemen, uh, Tunis, etc. The transformation, 
I think the transformation of the Ottoman world as a result of the conquest of Egypt, I will point to two, uh, two issues that I think are very important. The conquest of the Arab world, of the Arab uh, speaking lands, I should say, uh, brought about, firstly, uh, it, it changed the Ottoman Empire from a majority non-Muslim population to a majority Muslim population. This is very important for many reasons. Uh, number one, the ideology of what is, an, what is a legitimate ruler changed. Uh, I refer to the work of uh, Zvetlana Buzov, who worked on the Qanun Nami of Egypt, and she analyzes in detail the way that the, the Sultan is addressed with new a new vocabulary related to the uh, new religious identity. Uh, another element that confirms this is the fact that soon after, a few, a few years later, the creation of a post of Grand Mufti was created. And the Grand Mufti of the empire of whom uh, Sheikh Abu Saud is the most important one in the 16th century, uh, was the person who uh, it's not like a mufti in the general sense we use today. He was an official mufti in the sense that all the laws that were issued by the sultan had to pass by the, the grand mufti to make sure they did not violate the sharia. So this, all this is part of a change uh, as the empire moves from a non-majority Muslim empire to a majority Muslim empire. Another very important change, transformation as a result of the conquest of uh, Egypt and Syria, um, uh, 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 is a, a commercial change. Uh, in 1500, at the time of the conquest, Yani, when the Ottomans conquer Egypt, there is in Istanbul, Istanbul is probably the most, the only important international port in the empire. Uh, the port, of, um, the port of Salonika was only starting to be developed in the end of the 15th. The port of Izmir was being developed towards the early 17th century. So, you know, at the time of the conquest, it was really mainly Istanbul that was the commercial center. What, the, what, what does the conquest bring? It brings in the Mediterranean ports of Egypt, Syria. Alexandra, Domiat, Rashid, Tripoli, uh, Tripoli, Beirut, to mention those I remember, not to mention the ports of the Red Sea, Gadda, Suez, Qusir are the most important. And I think this is a, a, a shift in the whole empire towards a, a mode that is more commercial. So that's a second very important shift. All this is well-known historical writings, and yet the mainstream histories of the Ottoman Empire, the weight of provinces is not really fully integrated, is not fully reflected. And even though the largest and the, the, well, the, largest and the wealthiest province, which is Egypt, um, uh, wealthiest in the sense that it has the highest tribute that goes to Istanbul, it has the enormous amount of grain that goes to Istanbul and to the holy cities. Uh, it, uh, it has the baroud or the gunpowder with which the Ottomans continue their expansion. In spite of all these things, the weight of Egypt is not reflected in the mainstream histories of the empire. So why is this the case? Uh, of course, to a certain extent, Eastern Europe is better reflected in Ottoman histories, but the Arab lands, not so much. Uh, maybe for ideological reasons, I'm not very sure. Uh, but I think what, what concerns us here is, uh, I think this is a historiographic problem. It is a historiographic problem in the sense that it's a problem to write about empire anywhere. And most writings of empires, I'm talking about the Mughal Empire, the British Empire, the French Empire, the Dutch Empire, the Spanish Empire, I've looked into all of these. Uh, the same trend exists. Either you're writing about a history of the province, 
or you're writing a history of the capital, it's very difficult to write a history of the two. Um, uh, of course, one of the main reasons that this happens is that um, if we take uh, the Ottoman Empire, Istanbul is where the, so the Sultan is residing. It is where the orders are issued. It is where the administration is located. It is where the wealth flows in, and it is the center of where is power. And for historians, of course, it is also the location of one of the richest uh, uh, so, uh, archival sources in the Islamic world. So it is normal that one should want to go and study there. Thus, on the one hand, we have a rich history of Ottoman Egypt that has been written and is still in the process of being written. We have a very rich history of the Ottoman Empire. And so what is missing is how do, how do these connect? And I mean not only Egypt, I take it as an example. I mean not only the Ottoman Empire. This is a problem for all writings on empire. There's a lot of writing on empire these days. And there's a lot of scholars who are searching for uh, for ways to overcome this problem. They search for an, uh, for an, for an alternative uh, to writing about empire while at the same time, how do you write about empire without making the province a periphery? A periphery means something not so important. Without presuming that, uh, or without using a diffusionist uh, uh, method. What is a diffusionist method? A diffusionist method is a method by which everything is uh, is concentrated in the center and then is diffused everywhere else. So if you know what's going on in the center, you more or less know what's going on everywhere else in a more diluted, in a simpler way with minor um, with minor modifications. This is very top-down history and. And this is, I think, one of the, the issues with writing, um, writing uh, a new kind of history of empire. So here is something that I'm suggesting, and I've worked a lot on this, and it's taken me years to come up with an alternative idea. Um, focusing my work on the six, or what I want to say on this, mainly on the 16th century. Uh, 16th century in Ottoman history is the age of centralization. This is what it is called anyway, and I think this uh, description of the reign of Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent al qanuni uh, it is more or less ex uh, accepted that this is the period of high power the period of high centralization of the center. Uh, I think this is not a bad description. It is a correct description. Sultan Suleiman was a, a powerful ruler. He was there for a long time. He issued many, many kanuns, uh, which, uh, which were dis dispersed or diffused uh, to the different pro uh, provinces. He issued land reforms, and his land reforms were supposed to be applied everywhere. There were surveys. It's a period of land surveys. The land surveys were very important. Every time a new territory was conquered, a new land survey was uh, undertaken. Uh, there are WEF surveys, and these were taken in many, many places, and they were redone several times. In the mid-century, there are records of land surveys and uh, surveys of uh, land waqf in, I don't know, the re I mean, th some of the documents are in Istanbul, and sometimes we don't have the documents, but there are references almost everywhere in the empire. So it is a major undertaking. It could not have happened very often. It did happen in the mid, towards the middle of the 16th century, so I think we cannot reject the idea of centralization. But the idea of centralization needs to be a little bit redefined. It needs to be redefined. Um, it needs to be 
defined in terms, both in terms of, I mean, in terms of the Ottoman Empire, in terms of other empires, the 16th century, just to compare with other empires, is also the age of Ivan the Magnificent of Russia. It is the age a little bit later, maybe 17th, Louis the 14th, the Sun King. But are they really that powerful? Is the big question. In, I mean, in, in the context of the 16th century, can you be that powerful? Can you be that powerful given the type of communication you have, the type of technology that there is, the, uh, the type of, especially the speed with which you can communicate? Uh, I think a lot of this is discourse, is how to, uh, 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 these bureaucracies were able to, blo to bloat the images of empires to give the impression uh, of a greater power than what they really had. Uh, so one of the big problems, Sultan Suleiman or anybody else, any of the other, any of the other empires, for, for example, the, the Portuguese empire. Sultan Suleiman, I mean, the Ottoman empire is all one piece. Uh, but in this period, there are also empires which are in very different pieces, like the Portuguese empire has bits in Brazil and bits in uh, Asia. So how do these empires communicate? I'll give a few examples with which I'm familiar with in the Ottoman Empire, based on the work of uh, Kaya Shaheen, for example. Kaya Shaheen writes, um, he writes that Ibrahim Basha came to, was appointed as Basha in Egypt. From the date of his appointment in, excuse me, I think in, in April 1524, he took a sea trip. There was a big storm, so the ship, ship had to stop. He continued the land route, and he stopped a while in Aleppo, and he reached his post where he was supposed to be governing in April 25, seven months later. I think this is indicative. It's not the only time, but it's, it's an example. It's an example that could happen in the Ottoman Empire, and for sure it happened hundreds of times in other empires, and this is a subject that Fernand Brudel has written much about, in his book on the Mediterranean. Distance is a problem. You cannot control something when, it, when you are so distant, and that includes orders, and includes sending your personnel, and includes receiving answers to your queries. It is very difficult to communicate in these conditions. I mean, in the sense of power that we have today. When we think of power today, we have to think in two switch it and think about power in the 16th century with the conditions of the 16th century. There is another point which I think is also relevant in terms of technology. With the example of Egypt again, the most important tax in Egypt is the land, the land tax, al kharag How do you measure the land? The book of Muhammad Afifi is very interesting, his book on wealth. Uh, it doesn't tell us how the land is measured, but it tells us how the land is delineated. How do you, pr how do you say this is tax land or state land, and this is private property or waqf land? You put stones. Tahgir. The borders are uh, uh, delineated by stones. It is so easy to move stones. Uh, so this is one example of uh, the conditions of the 16th century that have to be taken when we talk about uh, control and centralization. It tells us that people other than so the Sultan have the power to do things, to change conditions to shift uh, the orders that came from the center in order that they fit, uh, in order that they fit the, uh, the, the province. Okay, to go back to the question of how do you write a history of the empire and of the province in 
one, narrate it in one story, make it one, uh, one historical development. Uh, what I found quite useful is while we accept the idea that centralization exists, we have to accept that. After all, the empire survived you know, for, for six centuries, so it must have been successful in doing that. But what is interesting is to see the other side too. And what I found to be useful is a paradigm that does not include centralizing, but that also adds to it decentralizing. So that at any point, there are forces of centralization there's a powerful force, and there are forces of decentral, decentering. I don't want to say decentralization. It's really decentering because decentralization has other meanings. Decentralization means people are looking to overturn the government or to protest. No, this is not what I mean. I mean two forces that are existing at the same time that have to confront each other in a continuous way and that have a high degree of uh, change. I mean, the, the, the balance between centering and decentering can change at any point, at any time, depending on the context. So in other words, it is, con it's a, it is a continually changing process. It is not a phase. Uh, uh, very often in Ottoman mainstream histories, we see phases phases of centralization, I mean, you know, in the Cambridge histories, for example, the centralization followed by decentralization, followed by reforms. Uh, very often it takes its form. I'm not talking about stages. I'm talking about a continuous process, a, a process continually being uh, in action. And I will give a few examples uh, for Egypt to tell you what I mean and how this can w be worked out. As I was saying, the most important element of the yearly tribute that Egypt had to pay to Istanbul was the land tax, it by, far, by far the most important. It was also the most difficult to collect. From the very beginning, the, as soon as the Ottomans come, the first thing that they need to find out in order to get this tribute is to find information about the land. Where is the, for example, where are the registers? When does the, when does the peasant pay? I mean, there are seasons, you know, land is seasons. There's some harvest at different times. Uh, who collects them? How is it calculated? All these are very difficult issues. And they're not issues that are well explained in manuals. They are traditional issues that people who do them have done them for many generations and do not need to record them in books. But they wanted the registers, at least uh, the record of what they should get, how much this is owed to the state. Well, people hid the records. The people in charge of the financial administration gave them some re uh, registers and hid some other registers. And they could, sometimes they, uh, they gave them willingly. Very often they hid them in their houses. Sometimes some of them were tortured to give registers and some of them gave in and some of them didn't. But we have for the about 30, 40 years following the context, they're still asking for registers. Uh, uh, why? Because under the, under the Mamluks, the financial administration of Egypt was in the hands of a few people, not the Mamluks. The Mamluks were not very interested in the details of finance. They were interested in the outcome. It was in the hands of Diwan officials or Mobashirin. These Mobashirin became very powerful and the basis of their power was their knowledge of financial matters. So they were not eager to give this knowledge to strangers. Not even to, the Mamluks were not so interested, but not to the Ottomans anyway, because 
by giving away this knowledge, you lose your position. And this is what happened during the 16th century. By the end of the 16th century, these people, these Mubasharin, who in the 15th century were extremely wealthy and extremely powerful, are no longer important in the scene in the 16th century. So first of all, the search for knowledge. So in, f in fact, I mean, to put this in the framework, the military is an important power. Egypt was conquered by military means. But there are other forms of power. There is the power of knowledge. And the power of knowledge is different from the power of the military. Once the military is finished and you need knowledge, some other people come into the picture and have different tools. Their tools are not to give knowledge. Not everybody, some of them were willing to give their knowledge. Some of them were massacred. I mean, there are all kinds of things. But I want to say it was not smooth. It was not an easy, you know, in, in classical books on Ottoman Egypt, like Stanford Shaw. Stanford Shaw says you know, the, the moment that the, the Ottomans were able to conquer Egypt, they have full control. Well, no, that's not true. They do not have full control. They have full control of the military. But they do not have full control of the financial. It takes them about half a century to really understand financial administration and to get the kind of information that they want. And once you move into you know, different kinds of knowledge, you move from the divine officials have their interests. They don't want to lose their, their position of their monopoly positions. Uh, state agents are sent from Istanbul to measure the land because they figure out, you know, the state agents will be able to threaten the peasants. But in fact, the peasants don't give them correct information. The peasants too have interests, but they know the land, they know the surroundings, they have a certain context that they can uh, function in. There's, uh, the, the sources we have, the Ottoman sources that we have, like the, the, con, um, the land law of, uh, 50, of, of 1553, they actually say so. They say they gave us wrong information. Even the Qadis that we sent to supervise gave us wrong information. So they do not get the right information. It is not easy. And I think this goes on. Uh, uh, information is a major problem. And when you talk about the land tax, there are so many levels of people. There are officials in the Diwan, there are local officials in the agricultural areas, there are peasants. Each one has his own uh, um, criteria, his own interests, and each one has something that they can hide in order to keep the interest, uh, keep as much as they can for themselves. <sighs> So all this works uh, as decentering uh, forces. Um, uh, perhaps one last point in relation to this issue of land. The Ottoman structure, administrative structure of Egypt was made up of a Besha who governed, a Qadi Qoda who in, char in charge of the judiciary, and a daftardar in charge of financial matters. Immediately after the conquest, an Ottoman daftardar came to see what he could do. He obviously, we don't know much about them because we don't have the sources, but everything that we do know indicates they were not able to do their work properly. So you had one after another, one after another, one stays two months, one stays one year, one stays a few days, and then, um, uh, and then leaves with no big results or no big change as far as our sources are concerned. And then in the course of a while, uh, the Ottomans employ an, a person from Auled in Nes to become Diftardar. Who is Auled in Nes? Auled in Nes are the descendants of the Mamluks. Auled in Nes uh, is Auled in we say Ibn al we don't say Ibn al we say a singular Awlad al Nas is a person whose father was, a mem was purchased, was a Mamluk. So we find, uh, as of 1526, after there have been many of Ottoman Deftalidars come and go, come and go, come and go, they appoint someone called Janim al Amir Janim al Hamzawi, 
who, who came with Khair Bey from Aleppo and who is referred to as Aulad al Nas. And he is Daftar Dar for uh, until he's killed in, uh, in, uh, in 1536. And then comes uh, uh, again a period of quick changes of, is of Daftar Dars from Istanbul. And then again, another Mamluk Emir called Ibrahim Bey Daftar Dar, whose father was governor of Alexandria, is appointed Daftar Dar. So, why is this significant? It is significant, these people did not try to overthrow the government or did not try to kill the, the, the best or anything like this. This is no political, no political conflict. But these people are in charge of the financial, uh, uh, they are of the financial office of Egypt, in charge of the tribute. It's a very important position, in charge of the tribute of the most and the richest state. But they also have their own interests. They also get rich themselves. They also help other Mamluks stand on their feet. And so there is double interest. There is a dual, a dual facet to their person. And this, of course, is also, I mean, they serve the empire. They, they offer important services to the empire because uh, after Janib al-Hamzawi is appointed, it's only after he's appointed that the uh, the tribute is regular. We don't know how complete it is, but every year it is sent, uh, as we know from Istanbul archives. Uh, so you have this sort of in between. They serve, yes, they serve one side, but they also serve another side. And therefore I consider this too is a kind of uh, decentering force. All this happens in the formative years following the conquest, the years in which the financial policies were put together. Uh, it is very, we don't, I mean, there are no specific uh, references to this, but we can suppose uh, that they, maybe Janim and Hanzawi had something to say to determine the amount of the tribute. Why not? He was very powerful at the time. He went to Istanbul at the time that the Qanun Nami was being uh, formulated. So was it a Mamluk who advised them how much tribute Egypt should pay? Maybe, why not? Uh, other policies that were formed at the time, uh, the Qanun Nami, for example, mentions, this is the work of Waka Ko Kamakura who has worked on some very important records. She has worked on the Qanun Nami to show the, the number of times it refers to Qanun Qayd Bay, uh, which of course does not exist. There's no such thing as Qanun Qayd Bay, but somebody told them there is Qanun Qayd Bay which says this and this and this. We have no evidence whatsoever in any of the Mamluk sources that Qanun Qayd Bay made, uh, that Qayd Bay ma made the Qanun. He did not make a Qanun. In fact, he had many different laws and he often had very contradictory laws or regulations. So this is a kind of, uh, who knows, a, theor a theory uh, that they may have had, uh, they may have had a say in matters of this kind, to be, uh, you know, to be explored further. Of course, uh, difficult to say. Uh, I I am talking on the basis of what I know so far. It I may be wrong, but uh, it is an, a, a hypothesis. <sighs> Okay, in, in conclusion, the use of, 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 of the paradigm centering and decentering. I think this is, uh, a, a, it shows, it allows us to have a to see a dynamic relationship between the center and the province. And it allows us to see this as a process which can, which can change whenever there is a change in the context of the, of the time. I mean, uh, the examples I have referred to uh, are in the 16th century, which like I said is you know, the age of centralization. But I think we can use the same paradigm in other periods in which uh, the center was less powerful, but we would have to adjust 
the balance between centering and decentering. I think what is also very important is that when you look at the empire from the angle of the province, you see a different picture. You see, in the province, you see a certain picture of what is power and what is centralization. But if you see it from distant, a distant province, it is a different picture. The picture is not the same. The, 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 the idea of power is not the same. And so I think it changes our definition of what is power. And I think it is worth looking at things from the province to really understand how an empire functioned. It did not function in, uh, let's say, it did not function in the way the orders were issued, because orders are issued, and by the time they reach their destination, a lot of things can happen. Uh, uh, another point uh, with regard to the paradigm of decentering is that uh, it includes people, it includes different uh, levels of society uh, that play a role in the development of empire. I mean, empire is not only Deftardar and Basha and uh, Neshengi, it is also the, the Mubashirin, the peasants, the state agents who went to to, to the rural areas, all of these play a role. It's a small role, maybe, but it could be a bigger role. I mean, we have to define, the, you know, the way, to, the way to be defined. Uh, uh, but in the end, I think we get a deeper understanding of what is empire. In fact, in fact we can call it a, a social history of empire rather than empire, because we see a little bit deeper into the workings of the empire. I think I've said, I've said it all. Um, just to add that this uh, paradigm can be applied to periods when the empire was not so powerful, so we would give a bigger role to decentering. Uh, and it can be applied to other empires with different conditions. And thank you very much for listening. Uh, uh, thank you, Nelly. So we have a few minutes for questions, if you have. Oh, please. Uh, hello, Professor, again. <laughs> I'm always talking, sorry. Uh, I found <coughs> something in Ottoman archive in Istanbul. In 1733, uh, the Yusuf Bey is Memluk. Uh, it's starting as a Ruznamche in Egypt. And 1739, he became a Deftardar. And his job is going to 11 years. Uh, it's finished in the uh, 1750. After that times, Ottoman uh, Egypt governor never sent again in Istanbul to, to, to his tribute by year by. To distribute? To tribute, yeah, Irsaliye revenue. Never sent again by year by. Yes, in normal times, every year is Egypt sent to his Irsaliye revenue. But after the uh, Yusuf Bey, uh, never sent again, every year. It's starting two, two years after that sending. It's starting three years after that sending. Almost the 30 years, during the 30 years, it's going the same. After 15 years later, Bulut Kapanali Bey rebellion is start, and again, all financial system is collapsed. And uh, last quarter of the 18th century, it's starting with uh, the plague and also, again, conflict between the Memluk, and never sent again. During the 25 years, only, only the Irsalia revenue is sent five times. Why is happened always? In the 18th century, the conditions are very different from the 16th century. Because in the 18th century, the Memluk, yeah, what we call the Memluk households, uh, control 
uh, the finances. The 16th is very different. The 16th, uh, the people I mentioned, they work for the empire. This time they work uh, for themselves. Any other question? That's it. Hmm? Oh, please. Thank you, Dr. Hanna. Uh, I'm asking about Mamluk's era, uh, which has Mubashirin for financing. Mubashirin, you call them, uh, for uh, who, who uh, used to have knowledge in financing. Were they Egyptian or from other nationalities? In the Mamluk? Yes. Let's say they were Egyptians, but of course they could be Syrian. Why not Mamluk? Why not? Ah, yeah, no. They're not Turkish. They're, they're not, not Turkish. They're not slaves. They're not Mamelik. Yes. Shall I? I have a, a, a very short question about. Uh, uh, you, you were talking about how the condition of capital shouldn't uh, generalize for the other part of the empire. Can we apply the same methodology for the? Uh, urban society and the countryside. If we, for example, in Egypt, we are talking about Cairo and the history of Egypt, but we neglected the other part of the Egypt. So, can we apply the same methodology in in this in local scale? Thank you. I don't see why not, except that for the uh, the rural areas for Upper Egypt, we do not have sources. I think it is a problem of sources, but the, why shouldn't the methodology work? Uh, I mean, for the 16th century, we do not have sources. Maybe for the 19th century, there are sources, and you can apply the same methodology. You have a government that is powerful. If you talk about the 19th century, it can send its agents. The technology is more improved. The, the education is, you know, more spread out, so you have to take this into consideration, but still the peasant can do many things. Yeah, and the peasant can uh, burn the... the uh, So he's not f totally unpowerful. He's not. Um, I have a question about not obeying firmans or orders coming from the, um, the center of the empire. So if, if a, uh, an order is issued and then not followed in the province, is there any evidence that the sultan would like take revenge or uh, punish or... Um, and especially in the 18th century, probably when the, the power was much decentralized. So was the Sultan powerful to control what's happening if his order is not followed? Thank you. I think it is a bit biased to write a history on the basis of orders. You cannot write a real history if you just write on orders. Orders are usually not obeyed, maybe not obeyed completely, maybe obeyed according to the interpretation that somebody else gives them. Orders, uh, uh, if you follow an order, for example, I can give you, Yani, from, uh, you, uh, um, after the conquest of uh, Hungary, in Hungary there were uh, 1541, in Hungary, there were many land regimes, land, private land, land by emirs, land, yani many private uh, forms of land. And so they decided, uh, the Sultan or the Nishangi or, sub, or the authorities, uh, to unify, okay? They unified with the help of uh, Sheikh uh, Abu Saud to make it legal. And the order was sent in many countries, surveys in many countries. The new land law of the Ottoman, of the Ottoman state, was it followed in Egypt? Yes. Why? Why was it not followed in Egypt? Because they found a category of land that does not exist in Istanbul. Its land is called al-Rizq al-Ahbasiyah. 
It only exists in Egypt. So what do you do? What did the Basha do? He incorporated it into the Ottoman land law. You see? So it became, it became okay in the land of Egypt. Masalan. This is an example. I mean, it is not all um, disobedience and fighting. And uh, part of it is, there, is, is like that. Part of it is stealing, a lot of stealing. And part of it is, uh, you know, meshi uh, halak. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, there's no other question. So the people are so tired because we spend long time working groups. So thank you again, Nilihana. Thank you. Thank you.